Well, good afternoon um, and welcome to the Petoskey Library this afternoon uh, in the midst of what can only be described as unusual circumstances. And um, I, I want everyone to know that the folks who are nice enough to have stopped in this afternoon are comfortable with me taking my mask off, uh, which is appreciated because I still haven't figured out how to use a mask and glasses and see where I'm going. But I suspect I'm not the only one who's in that, in that particular place. Um, when, I, uh, when Mary first asked me about uh, being here um, uh, almost a year ago, I think it was, uh, I was delighted with the idea. I was delighted in part because I've been to the library any number of times. Um, we brought book boxes of books over for donations and in the Carnegie Library across the street, I've been to uh, all, all the writers, local writers fairs that have been normally held there in August. Um, so I, I like coming here and, you know, it's just, it's fun. So to be able to help out uh, uh, is something that I wanted to do. And then when uh, circumstances changed and Mary said, are you willing to play with it a little bit and see what we can come up with? And I just said, sure. So that's why I'm here today. And I'm even more appreciative that some folks from the board have decided to stop in this afternoon because it makes it a little more fun for the uh, actually talking to people instead of uh, just the camera. Um, so anyway, this afternoon, I'm going to talk about the writing that I've been doing uh, for the last um, oh, eight or nine years uh, that have led to a series of mysteries slash private eye books called the Michael Russo mystery series or the Michael Russo thrillers. Michael Russo being the lead character um, in, in the books. The, he's the private eye and more about, more about him and the characters later. Um, the world of crime fiction is one that I have a great deal of affection for, and it's because I like to read it. And I like to read true crime as well as fictional crime. Uh, and I'm a big fan of some of the novels that I suspect, uh, crime novels, for lack of a better phrase, that you all are probably familiar with over the years. Um, I mean, I like to read them and I like to play with them. And, and um, there have been a lot of times when I've actually gone back in a few of those books to remind myself of a few things, and here are a couple. Whenever you're talking about crime fiction, and any fiction really, but we're dealing with crime fiction, there's uh, several things we need to deal with, and one is uh, the setting, the place. Where does it take place? And some series writers, um, of which I can name a couple, like Steve Hamilton, who's a Michigan guy, you know, and his private eye is based in Paradise up in the UP, um, and there are others. Uh, William Kent Kruger is another man that I'm a big fan of. He's northern Minnesota with his private eye. Um, and, and then the one that I probably admire the most is Robert Parker, who did the Spencer Detective series based in Boston. And that was his locale. Now, it doesn't mean that those heroes and, their, and the writers of the heroes don't go other places, but this is the base. And so there are a lot of places. And in the case of um, uh, I think I think Steve Hamilton using Paradise is probably the example of someone who's gotten more out of a smaller town um, than anybody could imagine, and I and I think that's a, that's a, a credit to him. Uh, now, in my case, it's Michael Russo, um, the private detective, is based here in Petoskey, and in fact, uh, for those who have read any of the books, you know that it's somewhere down the the, the, the sidewalk from. Uh, McLean and Aiken and Roast and Toast, um, uh, because both of those are figure prominently, of course, in the places that uh, Russo and some of the other characters in the book spend time. And it's actually an office on the second floor with a retail shop um, uh, on the first floor. Not unusual. I mean, it's actually can happen that way. And, and then uh, A.J. Lester, who is the lead woman in this story, and it's and, uh, Russo's partner and, and um, love interest, she actually lives down Bay Street, um, or up Bay Street, um, over there where it overlooks the ravine, you know, and there's that whole wooded area in there, just before you turn if you have, to, because you got to go back up. And, um, and, I, and I put her mythical house right there. And that's part of the fun too. I mean, I can, I can take real things like there are actually retail stores and you know, office or apartment spaces up above over here on Lake Street. And, um, and then there are the ones that I change. And I, I'll mention a couple of changes as we go along. So in any case, what I wanted to do, just to get a feel for the kind of thing, because when I do, um, when I do 
uh, places, sometimes it's a straight description. And sometimes I try and do a little bit of a description with some sort of feel to it so that the reader gets not only what it looks like, but get some kind of connection with the place. Now for you all, you probably get it right off the top and it's really easy because this is home, right? And um, so I wanted to just share a couple of, everything I'm reading today, by the way, is intermittent and short because I don't <laughs> like to do this, but there is, a, there is a purpose behind it. So here are a couple of examples of places. Um, here's one that pretty much is a simple, straightforward description. It's the side door saloon, over on 31. And Russo is showing up there to meet a man named Lenny Stern, who is the crime reporter um, uh, for the Petoskey Post Dispatch. You know, that's the news. Okay. There's some things I change, some things I leave the same. I've messed around with the Post Dispatch, so I figured it could be the news review. I got to the side door a little after five. Once you get by the waiting area, which is much too small during the tourist season, the room opens to a big rectangle with a few dividers to break up the space for tables. The walls are wood and filled with memorabilia and big TVs. A bar wraps around one end of the room by the kitchen. I saw Lenny Stern on a stool at the far end. Hello, Lenny, I said, and slid into the stool next to him. And that's, you know, it's just simple, but, if, but for everybody who's been to the side door, you don't need any more of a description than that, really, to get a sense of the room anyway. And, and then there are some uh, other ones where um, I will do a change, and the change is because I wanted to alter where it is. So this is the Post-Dispatch, the news review. And we all know the one floor building, you know, sort of a stone's throw this way. But I wanted it to be something different. This is where it's fun to be a fiction writer. So this is the time, by the way, for this is late fall, and it's Russo again. The mist had let up, but it was still damp and gloomy. I stopped at McLean and Aiken to get a New York Times, then headed up Howard for the three block walk to the Post Dispatch. Howard Street was busy with traffic, but nothing like mid-July during the peak tourist season. I didn't even have to wait for the light to change to cross at Mitchell. Julianne Tomatoes wasn't busy either, a sure sign that business had slowed until ski season. The offices of the Post-Dispatch sit on State Street in the middle of the block just off Howard. A two, the two-story frame house built in the 1920s resembled others that lined city streets all over town, but this one had a large sign in the front yard. A barn red front door and shutters highlighted the white clapboard siding. It was redone years ago to accommodate the offices of the paper. Off the back of the house, not easily visible from the street, was a one-floor addition filled with more offices and graphic facilities. I climbed the front steps and entered the building. And so that one is one that clearly I made up <laughs> because we're not dealing now with real places. And that happens from time to time. Um, there is, for example, uh, prominently figured in all of my novels because there is an ensemble cast of characters, which I'm coming to in a moment, uh, but there is a, a, a couple of mafia folks who live on Mackinac, um, and uh, they have one of the big bluff houses, but they also own a hotel. Now, it doesn't take a, a lot of time to figure out I could not use a real hotel and say, suggest that it was owned by the mafia. That wasn't going to work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I invented one. Um, and there's, uh, people have had a lot. I know which hotel that is, they say. It's, it's a such and such. I say, well, that's got to be it. Because I always agree when somebody says they've got it mailed because it makes them feel real good. It doesn't matter whether they do or not. They're having fun and so am I. So the next thing, though, uh, after place and setting um, is character. And the characters, in my case, um, you know, revolve around an ensemble cast that shows up, most of them show up novel after novel after novel. There are five novels um, right now uh, uh, that you can buy at McLean and Aiken. Um, and then there's one that'll be coming out next spring. I've finished the, all but the last edit before it goes to the real editors to do the work. Um, and in, and in, the, in the cast of characters, as I said, most of them show up in most of the books, some more or less than others. Because these characters, in the kinds of places that I talk about, Petoskey primarily, because that's where Russo's based, but Mackinac Island, Traverse City, um, it, we're moving on to Alpine and Gaylord occasionally uh, in the future and Eastern UP. 
All of this fits together with what are known as the conventions of the crime genre. And, and that means that there are certain kinds of things that happen uh, in crime fiction um, to give a grounding for people who like crime fiction. So for example, there's gotta be some kind of crime, you know, you know after you get the place that it's gonna be, there's gotta be some kind of crime or plot or something going wrong for which then you need, in my case, the services of a crack sharp private eye. Maybe it's a cop in another one, but, but for us it's, it's Michael Russo and his associates. Um, and then for the private eye genre itself, you get what are mostly, um, and I love to list this because it's the professional investigator, the sidekick, the cops, meaning prosecutors, and the criminals. Because that shows up over and over again in crime fiction, but also in private eye books. And if you've read, for example, um, well, uh, certainly uh, Sp Spencer and Hawk. Spencer, Robert Parker's Boston-based detective, and Hawk is his sort of gunslinger off in the wings who, you know, you don't mess with him. You just don't mess with him. And so um, I created um, a, a sort of sidekick as well, again, to fit the conventions of the, the genre for private eyes. So when we put together some of the, you know, the, the larger setting in place, and we put together some of the characters getting dropped into the setting in place, then that's where the things like the, the crime, the plot, and what happens and how it gets resolved or not, that's where all of it takes place. And so there's a certain familiarity. And um, as a couple of you mentioned, um, oh yeah, I know where that street is. And you, when you mentioned that your guy went into that building, sure. And that's what I want. I, I love to do that and, and, and I, th I think it's fun. And there's been a few occasions, there have been a few occasions, uh, Death Lease is one, that, that was number four in the five. Death Lease is one where I actually took Russo out to California for a visit that was necessary in terms of the plot to talk with an important witness. But for the most part, it's still based roughly in the tip of the mid area. Traverse City, we spend time in, um, in, as I said, we will be going a couple of other places, but by and large, it's up here. And I wanted to do that with occasional ventures like this. Lansing and Detroit will pop up pretty soon um, in um, the book that's about to come out next spring. And, and again, that's fun. But the setting for the crime is going to be wherever it's going to be. In this case, it could be Petoskey. It could be uh, Mackinac Island. Uh, Traverse City has had its own cases of that. Um, and occasionally, it's a made-up place. And so in the, in the first of the novels, Cherokee Point, murder, murder at Cherokee Point, which I'll get to, this is murder at Cherokee Point, which I'll get to in a second. Um, it's a mythical, old-style resort, the kind of thing that's it's still peppered in New England with a lot of these. There aren't many around here, um, around here meaning the Upper Great Lakes. And I needed to put this old-style resort someplace that was easy to get to in Petoskey, because that's where Michael Russo's office is. And I needed to figure out some way to make it secluded enough to have this sort of cachet that it was, you know, only for a certain class of people, you know, who go there. So I put it just north of Harbor Springs on the lake. And um, it has been fun when people, because I can tell when they ask me the question, they say, you know, I've driven that road. A lot, you know, it, you have to get, isn't it the tunnel tree, something called that? I said, yeah, that's what they call it. And, <laughs> after, and, you, get, and you headed toward, and you headed toward Legs Inn, and, and now it's got to be south of Legs Inn. Wonderful. You know, I couldn't ask for anything better because people who like Northern Michigan, let alone live here, um, people who like Northern Michigan are trying to imagine themselves in the places and the settings where all of this stuff takes place. And that for me means I'm getting something right, at least most of the time. That for me means they're uh, figuring out a different way to associate with what's going on in the book besides just um, the murder or the robbery or the shenanigans that are taking place. And so um, when you put together the characters and you put together the places, um, then there are things that happen in the course of the story that add to both of those, add to the richness of what we know about place and add to the richness of what we know about character. And this is a first one is going to be place. And this is 
a different way to describe something without actually doing much description like I just did with side door. And, um, and it's Mackinac, Mackinac Island. And um, I only put in uh, one little spot here, and this is probably about 70 pages in the book. This is the first time Mackinac gets mentioned, really. And this is how it comes up. It's Rousseau doing the talking. I was four years old when I first set foot on Mackinac Island. Don't remember much about that trip, but I remember most of them since. Summer after summer, weekend after weekend, vacation after vacation. Mackinac Island infected my imagination and my heart. The land of the great turtle was, was first the land of the French, then the British, always Native American, and now a summer colony of tourists and residents in a curious, uneasy mix of history, commerce, and fun. I never tired of pulling into the harbor and taking in the expanse of downtown Fort Mackinac and the block cottages. And so, you know, there is almost no description in there at all. I mean, yeah, I know downtown block cottages, but it's all what Rousseau is remembering has accumulated in his heart over the years about going to the island or being on the island. And so that's another way that you can take a place and add to its character without actually describing, well, Main Street goes this way and Astor Street goes that way, although there is some of that. And hopefully the richness of the feel again. And of course, then it's fun, I say fun, to drop a murder right in the middle of all of that <laughs> because it's nice, tranquil, romantic kind of feeling and then say something. And that's the same kind of thing that you can do anywhere, you know, if you, to throw people off. So anyway, the cast of characters. Now, um, I like the cast of characters in, in the um, Russo mysteries because I have a lot of fun with them. And here are some of the people, and some of the names will be familiar if you've read them. There is, of course, Michael Russo, uh, who is the primary guy, the, the private eye, and his woman friend, who is a journalist, an editor of the online edition of the news um, at the, excuse me, the Post-Dispatch, um, and her name is A.J. Lester. Don't call her Audrey Jean. Her name is A.J. Lester. Then there is the sidekick, and his name is Henry Lacroix, Henri Lacroix, Henri Pierre Lacroix. Sandy Jeffries is the woman who runs the Russo investigation offices, and she is one who is smartass from the word go. She always takes everything Russo says seriously and never tries to let him know she takes him too seriously <laughs> because she don't know who's in. Then we've got the other side. We've got Captain Fleener. He is the state police detective who is the ace investigator, particularly for murder, and an ace interrogator in the room when they've got a suspect in a chair. And everybody wants to line up behind the window and watch him work when he's in the room because his reputation is impeccable and very good and well-earned. And then there's Donald Hendricks, the prosecutor. And Don Hendricks has been twice elected prosecutor in Emmett County. Uh, Don Hendricks is the kind of guy who's rumpled at 9.30 in the morning. And he always looks rumpled, even if it's not 9.30 in the morning. And then we've got a few other people that pop up from time to time. Of course, the DeMio family, that is D-E, capital M-I-O, I'll comment about that later. Um, and those are the mafia folks, father and son, and some of their gunslingers. And then we have people from the paper. Maury Weston is the publisher of the paper, editor of the paper. And Lenny Stern is the grizzled crime reporter who comes and goes in all the novels. And I will tell you, just don't tell anybody, but Lenny Stern is a featured character in the new one that's coming out next spring. Uh, too good to pass up. So I'm going to do a couple of little short things on the characters the same way I did the other ones in a minute ago. And, um, <clears throat> okay, so here's, here's first of all Henry. Again, this is a pretty easy way to do a description. Instead of the writer describing a character, which happens all the time, and I do it too, the description of some of the stuff about Henry Lacroix comes in the conversation between two characters in the book. And so here are a couple of excerpts. And the two characters are Donald Hendricks, the prosecutor I just mentioned, always ruffled, and Michael Russo, and they're in Hendricks' office. And this is shortly after Michael Russo, in the first book, has asked Henry to help him out in his investigation. Hendricks reached over and pulled a thick manila file out of a side drawer. 
He dropped it on, a, on the desk and opened the cover. Henry Pierre Lacroix, born on Mackinac Island, well in St. Ignace actually. One sibling, Francis Warren of Petoskey and Mackinac. Lacroix grew up on the island, schools, jobs, that sort of thing. Graduated from Northwestern University with a degree in finance. Magna cum laude, smart guy. Worked for a couple of banks for a while. I know most of that, Russo said. And then he, and he made a lot of money in Chicago and then bought property on Mackinac. It's what came in between that makes this guy interesting, Hendricks said. He enlisted in the army. Lots of people do that, I said. But not a lot go to Fort Benning. Ranger school? Uh-huh. One tour in Afghanistan, then back to Benning as part of the Ranger Training Brigade. The RTB is what they call it. Runs the school. He's one tough guy. He left Benning in 2003 and hired on with Blackwater USA. You ever heard of that outfit? I nodded. Mercenary, started by some Michigan guy, I think. Yep. Lacroix worked as an instructor at Blackwater's private battleground in North Carolina, but he left there after the killings in Fallujah. He went back to banking in Chicago and then eventually to Maginaw, Mackinac. Unusual bio, but what's your interest in Lacroix? Lacroix's trouble. Doesn't usually create it. But when he shows up, trouble shows up too. Mackinac County watches him up there. And when he gets down here, it's Emmett County's problem. So again, there's a, a couple of ways of adding character there for some other character in a way of a description, but through dialogue and through conversation, just because it's more interesting to do it that way. And I'll do one more. And this one is because it combines both A.J. Lester and uh, Michael Russo, um, a little bit about who they are um, as opposed to exactly what they are. Um, this is a, a sh relatively soon, again, in the first book after they met. Audrey Jean Lester graduated journalism school at Michigan State. Her first job was part-time on the rewrite desk and part-time as a reporter for the Lansing State Journal. She came to Petoskey as a reporter for the Post-Dispatch two years after I opened my practice. We met that first summer because she was writing a story about professionals who moved north to live and work. I couldn't take my eyes off her while she asked me questions over coffee with Julian Tomatoes. Uh, tall at about 5'9", AJ had an angular face and jet black hair she pushed behind her ears. It curled softly at her shirt collar. On that morning, she'd worn tan slacks and a rose-colored blouse and a loose scarf at her neck. I tried to look without being obvious. But when she got up to get coffee, I concluded I was attracted. After our first meeting, I kept calling with more information about her story. One afternoon, she walked into my office and said, why don't you cut the bull and we go on a date? <laughs> so I had, I had fun with that. So what, what you do when you get those characters is you can, you can enrich them as you go along, rather than just having these three or four paragraphs that say everything about the characters that can get a little tiresome. Uh, to read. And um, so we've got the place. We've got some kind of crime and setting. We have characters, now in my case, an ensemble cast that keeps appearing and reappearing. And then we put together a, in a series. And so I want to just make a couple of comments about the books for those who haven't read them. Uh, the first one, it's called Murder Cherokee Point. And this is the one that takes place at this mythical resort somewhere north of Harbor Springs on the lake. Um, that people have been trying to find now off and on for a while. Um, and it is about a murder that happens there, grisly murder, and the cops are stonewalled from doing their normal investigative tricks um, because there are too many high-powered, high-profile people on the resort or connected to people on the resort that they can put, a, put up a pretty heavy wall in front of any kind of police investigation. And the cops come along and say to Russo, can you help? The second one um, in line is called Murder on Lake Street, as in Lake Street. <laughs> and um, this one is one that I had in my head for a long time. Um, it's a story, uh, and, and it's interesting about this story because there is this characteristic of crime fiction or crime life fiction that says, Drop the body on the first page, better yet, in the first paragraph, because the reader expects that, or whatever the crime is. 
And so um, I wanted, I had this first opening, not even chapter, but this first paragraph in my, my head. And I had it there for months. And I thought, I've got to do something with it. And so this is only three sentences of chapter one at the first beginning. But this is the way it starts. Frank Marshall was shot three weeks ago last night as he left Ristorante Bella in downtown Petoskey. Four shots, three hits, two weapons, no witnesses, no suspects, no justice yet. You don't need to read the rest of the chapter to know where this one's headed. And, and, I, and I, it's interesting because I haven't read that opening until um, a couple of days ago when I was starting to put together my stuff for, for today. And I realized, you know, I like that. <laughs> I really like that because after all these years, uh, this was 2015 or 16, I think, it still works. And so I can still say right now, as I just did, you don't have to read the rest of the first chapter. That just fills in some of the details. You know where this book and this story are going and you know what Russo is going to be doing from those three sentences. You just know. And that's part of what I like about it. And it's also part of one of those things about dropping the body in the first uh, first page or the first chapter. Devils Are Here um, is one that um, is, is the third one in the row. And Devils Are Here actually, you know that Louise Penny has a book out called yes. um, uh, uh, Heaven. Well, actually, the whole quote is Hell is Empty, All the Devils Are Here. Mm -hmm. That's the full quote from Shakespeare, which is where I got this. Mm. Only I just took this part. I didn't care. I, you know, it's people say, Aren't you annoyed? Somebody. Let her have fun. She's going to sell more books than I am. <laughs> and um, and it actually was number one the New York Times bestseller list last, <laughs> last yeah, Sunday. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, anyway, this is about a small uh, college in Petoskey. And no, it's not in CMC. I put it, actually, this is about where Bill's Farm Market is. That's where I put it because I, need, I needed to get the hell out of town because I knew if I got it too close around, it would that would be, a, again, one of those things where you have. And all sorts of nefarious kinds of shenanigans happen. And I had fun with this one for a couple of reasons. One is my first life before I became a retailer at Birkenstocks on Mackinac Island 20 years ago uh, was as an academic. I spent uh, years on the faculty at Michigan State, had a, had a very nice career. Uh, I, I wrote all that kind of stuff that people like me are supposed to write in order to get promotions and tenure and all the rest. And it was bored to tears most of the time. I had a great time in the classroom. Um, but the other stuff, I wanted to write fiction. And I also had a few things I wanted to say about academic life. <laughs> um, now, I'm going to hold up these last two together. Um, Death Lease was the fourth one. Um, Death Lease, I like a lot. Uh, I, and I, I like it because I like the story. I like the way it unfolds. And I like, I like just a lot of stuff in here. Um, it's, um, I just, I, I'm just fond of it as a story. I mean, I, you know, my heart in some ways is with this one because it was the first one, but this one is, I just like a lot. And it is about a woman who owns one of the houses on the East Bluff on Mackinac Island, you know, the big ones we see when we pull into the harbor. And she goes to get a divorce from her husband, Conrad North. And when all the papers for divorce, uh, for the divorce are filed, her name's not on the lease. You know, the bluff houses on the island are lease, state of Michigan lease land. So that means you lease the land and you own the house and any outbuildings as personal property, just like a car. I mean, it's not a typical real estate uh, setup. So the lease, as she says, has been in my family for four generations. My name was the only name on the lease, she said. When we got married, and my name vanished from the lease when we got divorced. When the papers were filed, the only name on the lease was my husband's name, Conrad North, and not mine. And so she's in Michael Russo's office and she says, get my home back. And that's, you know, that's the, that's the genesis of the story. Now, the last one is called The Final Act of Conrad North, as in the husband. Um, this is the most recent one published. The new one, as I said, will be out in the spring. But um, I'll tell you an interesting little fact that most people don't know. Um, these, two are, these two are the only two that really are linked. Um, all, the, all of these can be read as standalone. So you can pick any one you want to start with. Start with number one. If you think it's good, read the rest. If you think it's trash, forget it. 
give it to you know the library to sell and um, and, and go on to somebody else. Um, but these two are really the only two that are connected. And part of it was um, my, when my editor got this one, that is, that is the draft was ready for the first serious editing by a professional. She said, uh, 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 Peter, um, it's, I, yeah, it's, it's like there's no ending here. And I said, well, sometimes things end up in the air. And she said, well, that's not there either. And then we had this nice long discussion over the phone. And it's because most of the resolution of what happens here takes place here. But she said, you don't want to do a book that long. You just don't want to do it. You know, I write for people who are hopefully getting two chapters in while they're waiting in the dentist's office, <laughs> you know, um, or they're, um, you know, they're sitting at the airport and they think, I think I'm up next to go on the plane. Back when we used to do that all the time. So anyway, she, we, we ended up, and it ended up to be two, two books. Um, this is the final act. Uh, this is res a resolution of everything that happens here. On the other hand, you don't have to read this one and then read this one, but it's a lot more fun that way. It just is. And so those are, um, those are the five uh, novels. The one coming out of the spring he does feature Lenny Stern, and he is the grizzled reporter um, who is, works for the Post-Dispatch. And Lenny Stern has a long career in crime, uh, crime journalism and crime reporting in the streets of Detroit and mostly Chicago. And um, so he has returned to Northern Michigan because he did a couple of stints in Northern Michigan and really enjoyed the place and wanted to come back to work in a place that normally could never afford a, a, a real reporter. So we learn that Lenny Stern has connections all over the counties of Northern Michigan. We learn that, that Lenny Stern um, has a, a number of connections downstate in places like Lansing and, um, and Detroit. And one of the comments that, um, because he's, he tends to, he, you know, he's kind of a gentleman and he swears a lot, but he's really a pretty good guy. And Russo said to him, Lenny, how did you survive all those years as a crime, as, as a crime reporter in Chicago and, and Detroit? How did you survive all those years and walk away? And he said, it was easy. You carry a gun and you tell the truth. And, I, I, and that's, that line is going to be featured prominently in the one that comes out in the spring. So basically, that is the lineup. Um, um, it's one of the ways in which I tried to, you know, tell my story about uh, the books, uh, about the characters, about the place and the setting that the stories take place. And so I want to just uh, finish a little bit with a few comments about how I got here um, today, how it became that I've, I've been at the Carnegie Library. I've, I have these books. Um, as I said, when I was an academic, I wanted to write fiction. Um, and then, uh, would have been 2011, I think, 2011, um, I was leafing through the brochure from the Interlochen Center for the Arts, because I help pay for radio, just like I do the one in Central, and, and so I'm on the mailing list. And I got this brochure in the mail, you know, a hard copy, about adult workshops. And one of them was about writing crime fiction. And that, my ears perked up at that. Of course, it was in the middle of the summer. So remember, I work Mackinac Island in the summer. That's when I earn a living. So I work every day, <laughs> every day. And fortunately, I had a couple of good people, our manager, as well as my business partner and spouse, say, you ought to just go. It's only five days. For heaven's sakes, the place will survive without you. <laughs> it did. And I went. <laughs> and uh, yes, it really did. And, but that workshop is where I made some really important connections. But the most important thing I found out is that I really felt in those five days that I had a shot at writing crime or mystery fiction because of the writing we did in the workshop. This was not one of those workshops, I will tell you, where you sit around and chit chat about the favorite books you read and then, then you leave and go drink wine in the evening and read stuff. This is not that, you work. We did six hours a day for four and a half days. And then the other half day, we, we talked about some other things. And that, that workshop was the kick in the fanny that I needed to give it a shot. And I didn't know whether I could do it or not. I really didn't. And I like to talk about this because, you know, I'm not a kid when I did this. It was, you know, 2011 or 12. And the first 
the first one became Cherokee Point. Now, I think I've gotten better as I've gone along. I hope I get better with every single novel. Um, I think people might agree, hopefully, that my writing and my storytelling has gotten better, but they might like another story better than one or the other. That's fine, because all the stories are not created equal. Some are going to be more interesting than one person more than the other. But I hope my writing gets more compelling and more interesting as I go along. But I wanted to just take a couple of minutes about that because, you know, since I wasn't 20 when I started to do this, um, there is always the possibility, if you've harbored in the back of your head about writing something, there are plenty of places where you can figure it out whether that's an option or not that you can think about. And although it's more difficult to have access to that kind of thing right now because of everything, at the same time, many of us have some extra windows of time that we normally would not have because whatever our normal lives were filled with, some of those things are gone or at least temporarily gone. So don't give up the idea that you might be able to do something like this. Whether you can write long fiction or not isn't even the point. The point is, if you think you're interested, there's so many resources to, to go after online, to at least read about what might be available. You know, it could be Interlock, and it, it could be um, N NMC in, in Traverse. It could be, if you're downstate part of the time, you know, uh, you know some of the extensions from places like MSU. So don't, um, don't overlook the possibility that it might be something at least worth your time because you just never know how much fun you might have. It's very hard work, I will tell you. In fact, the man who ran that um, workshop, his name is Aaron Stander, and he has his own uh, uh, series called Ray Elkins Mysteries. Um, and he says, it's about putting your butt in the chair and doing the work. And he was so right. There is no romantic vision of this. You know, this is not, you know, you sit there late at night with a small light on and a glass of single malt scotch. And you tell, you can do that if you want to, but that's not going to get any writing done. <laughs> it's putting your butt in the chair and doing the work. And that's the way he phrases it exactly. So I would love to have questions. Can um, I clap for you? Uh, well, thank you. Yes, I do have a question. How do you come up with the names, like, like Lenny? Oh, the character names you mean? Yes. Well, I don't know. The, the, the only <laughs> one, well, no, the only one I can tell you for sure was the private eye Michael Russo. I spent a lot of time, I mean, I had, I had sheets of eight and a half by 11 paper filled with first and last names because I needed it to do a couple of things. First of all, I wanted it to be Italian. And I'm, that comes back to the Daniel thing again. Um, my name is Maribel, but that was the English version, the anglicized version given to my grandparents in um, Schenectady, New York, because they came from Italy uh, and went to a, a company town, General Electric, at Schenectady, Albany, Troy. And the name was Mirabella, and it got changed to Pretty Maribel. Name. No t hmm? Pretty name. Oh, it is. Yes, it means beautiful water. Hello. <laughs> um, and um, it, but, but, but the thing is, no teacher was going to, ah, we're going to bother with that. It's Maribel. That's the closest. Oh, okay. So that one I spent a lot of time on because I wanted it to be an Italian surname. I wanted the first name and the second name to kind of roll easily because some do and some don't. Um, and I wanted the surname to be one that I could use only the last name repeatedly and have it be kind of identified as okay to do that, not just last name. So I spent a lot of time on Michael Russo. Um, Lenny Stern, you know, and some of the others, I don't know. Um, I will tell you, um, Audrey Jean Lester, uh, AJ, don't call her Audrey Jean. I used, I picked the initials um, AJ intentionally because I, I have a female friend who in her family is known as AJ. And I thought that'd be kind of fun. So I'll use AJ. Then I wanted to come up with a couple of first names that would at least sound plausible. She said, don't call me Audrey Jean, you know. It, and uh, so that one I can tell you. Demio, so this comes back to the Italian thing. I was asked during a q and A. I actually, I think it was last summer, I did a presentation at the library on the island, on Mackinac Island. And somebody asked me about, you know, you've got the mafia here, it's all Italian. You know, you're stereotyping the bad guys, you know, all, all the cohorts around, around um, uh, Carmine Demio and his son Joey um, are all Italian names. And, um, you know, and then you name them Demio, Don't, aren't you running into a problem here? And I said, no. And here's why. I said, first of all, I'm doing the traditional 
sort of Italian version of the mafia and the mob. That's the one I have fun with. And that's the one most people are familiar with. And so that's the one I wanted to use. It's more fiction than it is real, but most people know that. What about the name Demille? That seems to be, a, you know, you're just singling out. And I said, remember the generation in Schenectady, Albany, Troy? My grandmother's family name before she was married to Joseph Mirabella was Demille. So it's my family name. So if somebody wants to argue about it, <laughs> I'm using my own history, my own ancestry to name the characters. Um, but I understand the question too. So, so I wish I could give you a better answer than that. Some come easily, some don't. Um, um, you know, some of the ones are just names that seemed right at the time. Um, and, and, and Lenny Stern was one of those. Yes. Um, are you a fan of true crime stories? Like, do you listen to podcasts or watch movies or the, read? The, the answer is the, um, I don't, the only podcast I've gotten into are Marty Link's. Do you know Marty Link? Mm -hmm. yes. For folks, and she's a, she's a nonfiction writer. Mm -hmm. um, and she wrote, um, uh, started with a, um, When Evil, when comes, evil to comes to Good Heart, mm -hmm. um, about the killings in the 60s of the Robeson family. And, um, and, and so that's, that's as close as I get to reading a lot of it. I will occasionally read an article or something. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the books, um, I, I stick on the fiction side more often. And do you read, do you read the mm -hmm. true crime? Oh, do you? What, yes. what, what, what comes up? Just real quick. Um, I mean, a lot of it shows on investigation discovery. Yeah. And I listen to a podcast called My Favorite Murder. So. And I think Marty Link had one on the discovery. I think she did one of those mm -hmm. uh, shows a few years ago, if I remember correctly. Yeah, probably. Um, but that's the closest I get to it because I, I like making it up. Um, yeah. I just like making it up. Thank you. Well, watching a true crime means that I don't oh, believe anyone that. dies of natural death. That's <laughs> the other side of that problem. I'm very suspicious. I um I, I, can I use that sometime? I don't believe yes. anyone ever dies of natural death. <laughs> I love that. What a great line. You know, it's interesting to me. Um, well, of course, I, it, I um, William Kent Kruger, who does mm -hmm. the Northern Minnesota series, mm -hmm. he was interviewed virtually on the writer series. Doug Stanton interviewed him, um, and I and I that was one of those nights that I was able to get off work so I could watch it. And I thought the two of them did really well together, actually. Um, and, and, and I'd seen Kruger before. In fact, Kent Kruger and, uh, has been to the Mackinac Library before, and so is Steve Hamilton. And, and, then one time, and then one time they came and did a, yes, a, a, a stand-up. And that, yes, because here you got two guys with probably egos, and they're probably, and they're competing mystery writers, and they played off each other like a well-oiled machine. It was fascinating. And, and Kruger said, because, um, you know, Doug Stanton asked him, you know, right in the middle, look at what we're doing here. You know, we got masks on. We're doing this virtually. You're there and I'm here and blah, blah, blah. And, and he, what are you going to do about that? And he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've figured it out yet. Of course, none of us have figured it out yet, so there you go. But Kruger said, my books are always about five years ago. My books are always always take place about five years ago. Which, and, and in, I'm, I belong to a writing group. Yeah, there's four of us. And uh, we sat around. Um, actually, it was one of the last meetings we had in person before we now do it all on Zoom. Um, and we talked about this. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And, and I, for them, said the same comment. I said, five years ago, that's when I'm writing. Because until I figure out something different, I don't know what. Because it's going to be hard. Here's, here's my thought about uh, masks, shields distancing and all the rest. In, in five years or three, it's all going to change so much that all this will seem so out of date and passe and strange. Now what it'll change to, trust me, I don't have any idea, but it's going to change enough that I don't want to start writing about wearing masks and distancing and all, and what, what the restaurants look like that, you know, the, the characters hang out in and stuff, because I don't, know exactly where it's going to go enough that by the time I get through with the process of writing and rewriting, drafting, sending it to the editor, getting it back, sending it to the second editor, get, you know, I mean, this whole thing till, till I can actually say, it's in the bookstores, um, it'll all change. 
And so I like Ken Kruger five years ago. It's five years. I'll stick with that right now. And I don't think that's all bad because um, though if you look at the ones on the bestseller list, I just use that as a guideline. If you look at the novels on the bestseller list, they're all five years ago, unless you're telling a period story. You know, none of, I mean, that's just where we are right now. So I wish there was another way to. Well, speaking about time, how much time each day does a person have to spend, you know, on writing if they're going to produce a book? I, um, and, um, yeah, that's, that's my question. Well, it's a, it's a, uh, I'm, I don't, I'm not, I'm not ducking the, the question, really, but it, it, it's a difficult one to answer. Um, but the way I'd like to answer it is this, it isn't so much, um, the, the, the amount of time, whether it's, um, one hour or five hours in a particular day. Uh, now it's going to sound like if you could spend five, except five hours, you're going to drag yourself out of the chair and crawl on your hands and knees to the shower, you know, and try and do something. Um, but the important thing is that you have some sort of regular routine that puts your butt in the chair and does the work. Um, um, I'm trying to think, um, I don't think it's Stephen King. Stephen King has a really good book on, on, on writing. Um, I'm not a big fan of his mysterious thrillers and stuff like that, the paranormal, and stuff. that's just not where my head is, but, but I have a great deal of respect for him as a writer. Um, and it may be him, but, but it's uh, somebody of, a, of stature who said, if I only write one hour every day, I have written for one hour every day. And his theory, whoever I think it was King said, um, I can find an hour, even on the busiest days, even on the busiest days for something else, even on the busiest uh, vacation days. And I've got to be with, I can find an hour. I can find at least an hour. Can I add to you? Yeah, what, please. Um, um, one time a man walked into the gallery and pointed to one of Dick's paintings and said, how long did it take you to do that? And Dick said, all my life. Oh, that's good. I like that. Mm -hmm. God, that's two, Helen. <laughs> yes, because it is. Where's my pen? That's, <laughs> but I, but yeah. no, that's good. Because it is. It's a and for you, yeah. it's a combination of, you know, it's just you, you just don't because he has he had a little trouble with uh, um, weekend painters, you know, people who just thought it was a hobby, and he said, "This is real work." Yeah. Yeah, it's work. I um I, I but I also understand the question because you know yes. we, we all have busy lives and how do we fit it in is part of the question, right. and I and I think uh, this one the first one is uh, I'll talk a little bit more about in practical daily terms. Um, as I mentioned a couple times, I I do work on Mackinac and it's it's um, the Birkenstock store and and unlike most owners who aren't twenty. Um, uh, you know, I work at virtually every day, especially in Ju July and August, um, and then, you know, maybe five days a week only in the shoulder seasons. So winter is a good time, obviously, for me to do this because I have a break, even though there's a lot of work-related stuff to do, the doors aren't open. I don't have to take care of customers or fit Birkenstocks, and these are really Birkenstock shoes, by the way. Um, and, cool. And, um, and so that helps a lot, you know, if you can sit there in your sweatpants and, and do things. But here's the thing, this one, you know, since I didn't know, I, I put myself on what was only be described as an unrealistic schedule. So on the island, <clears throat> for example, I was up at five every morning and I would write for one or two hours each morning. And then I'm a runner. And if it was my morning to run, I'd write for one or two hours and then I'd go run, then I'd get breakfast and then I'd get to work and I'd work all day, you know, and then collapse at night. Um, but I probably would have collapsed at night without those two hours anyway. But I did that and I, I wrote over half the book from the 1st of May until Labor Day, the, of Cherokee Point. Now, I, I can't maintain that schedule anymore. I, with, with all due respect to my still being a runner and trying, you know, all those other things to stay healthy, I can't do that kind of a schedule anymore. So um, what I'm doing right now is taking a break because as soon as the season is over, I have to pull that, that draft up. But last year, when I was writing the one that's now the draft, as we were getting into this part of the season where I got two, sometimes three days off a week, because we have, we have people who work for us because the hours are shorter each day. They want to get their hours in so they qualify for unemployment. We want to make sure that they do that. 
And um, so I get extra time off, <laughs> it's fine with me. So on, let's say on a day, I, I would get up in the morning if I was gonna do some kind of exercise, I might do that. And I'd sit down, I'd write for maybe two or three hours in the morning, morning meaning, let's say from nine to noon, just for laps. And I may or may not go back in the afternoon on a day, that's on a day off. Because you do need that break time. You just need some break time. And back when I was doing some of these books, if, if I ever got two days off from the store, I would spend one whole day writing and then the other day, you know, just catching up on things like laundry and grocery shopping and stuff like that. Um, but it's more the regular schedule that's more important because if it's regular and part of what you do every day, then it's going to get done and it becomes less important how much or how long because I think from, from people I've gotten to know, they'll answer some, the part of the question this way and they'll say, well, yeah, I write one hour a day or whatever it is, one hour a day. Well, but then you know, I had this idea, you know, right after dinner, you know, and I, so I took some notes so I wouldn't forget it for tomorrow morning. And then I thought, well, you know, I'll just get the laptop out and, and just type the notes. And three hours later, the chapter was written. Mm -hmm. You get caught up in the story and that helps prepare you, propel you along. But it really is just getting your butt mature and doing the job. And one more thing about time. How yeah. long does it take from you finishing your novel to getting it actually published? How long is um, that wait time? In the in the case of in the case of a murder uh, a Cherokee point and I'll cover right back. In case of these two, um, it was twelve months okay. from the day I wrote the first word till it came out published. Bad decision on my part because it didn't have enough time to sort of gestate on its own before I read it again. So these three in the current, and this I know is Stephen King, because he says this in his writing book. When he finishes a draft, he doesn't care what it looks like. He doesn't care what it reads like. It could be terrific or lousy. He doesn't care. It goes in the drawer for six weeks. Now, in my case, it's six months because I like to finish a draft and we're going back to work on the island. And then it's gonna be November 1, roughly speaking, before I can look at it again. So it doesn't matter. But the point is, I did that with um, Devils, Death Lease, Final Act, and I'm doing it right now. It's sitting in the digital drawer right now while I'm standing here having such fun with you guys. Um, it's made for better books. Because the draft I will edit in November is gonna be a lot better than the draft that got edited before it went to my editor with these two because there was no time for these. So if, in that case, the answer is about every 18 months. But I timed them to come out in May because this is resort reading. You know, the bookstore next door to me, Island Bookstore in McLean and Aiken. Um, well, Island Bookstore is only seasonal. But McLean and Aiken will tell me they don't sell any of my books at Christmas time. This is really summertime reading. Fine, good. Horizon used to say the same thing. Um, in Traverse City and Front Street. Um, so about every 18 months or so. And if it took longer now, I wouldn't care the same way I did about those. Um, I was trying to get those done because I wanted to know that I could do it. But that, at that time when it was just put away, and I'm on the schedule with Mission Point Press, uh, the folks in, in Traverse City. Uh, started out with just two people, uh, Heather Shaw and Doug Weaver, sort of doing stuff on their own with their other jobs. And now they have a company called Mission Point Press. They have a wonderful website. They will do everything. They'll do the, the editing, the copy editing, the line editing. They'll help with graphics. They'll help with, you know, help you put together stuff for the back cover. You know, the little blurb we all read and say, well, I don't want to read that one. This one. Um, oh, I like the sound of that. And then, and quotes from people. Um, uh, they'll, they do everything and you just hire their services. And, and they, I think they do a really first rate job and it doesn't cost anywhere near as much as, as I or anybody else would pay in you know, places like Chicago or, or Detroit or New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's expensive territory. So, but if you figure 18 months to, to two years, that's not unreasonable. And it's not unreasonable. I mean, we read about people who say, well, that took five years to write that book. Okay, I get that. I mean, I, I suspect there are good reasons for that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for coming this afternoon. It's so much more fun with me for me to, to have uh, real people here to, to talk with. And thanks for the questions, everybody. I hope you have a pleasant uh, afternoon and stay safe, everybody. Okay, we'll get through this one.